right. Thank you, Janet. Welcome to Fairfax Republicans United States Senate Candidate Forum. Woo we are glad you're here and excited too. I love to see that. My name is Srile Harani Pali, and I can tell you how honored and privileged I feel just to serve as your moderator this evening. I, I can tell you that this is going to be a very good session. We have great questions. We've taken some audience questions as well. So you can hear you speak while I'm asking the questions. We are gathered here at UNAC McLean Community Center. We will hear from our four candidates, distinguished candidates, I must say, who are seeking to represent Virginia in the United States Senate. These candidates are Jonathan Amor, N.D. Garcia, Todd Parkinson, and Chuck Smith. As always, we have to have some ground rules for our candidates, for our distinguished candidates. Each candidate is allotted specific time limits for opening statements, responses, and also closing remarks. If a candidate is mentioned by another candidate for any reason, you will always get 30 seconds to respond to that. But if no candidate mentions, there are some questions that are more of uh, lightning round, limited 30 seconds, which I'll go over in the beginning of the session. Our timer, Rosie Oakley. All right, Rosie Oakley is right there. If you see her, <laughs> you know. She's the chair of 11th Commercial District of Virginia Republican Committee. I get to work under her and I'm excited about that. She'll display her beautiful panels for 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and starts with a buzzer if you're a repeat offender. So let's stick to the times. All right, audience, we also have a small uh, guidelines for you. Please silence your mobile phones and keep applause brief so we can maximize hearing from the candidates that are here for discussion. Tonight, each candidate will share their visions, priorities, and plans for our commonwealth and our great nation, America. We will begin with opening statements, two minutes each. So I will go ahead and get started with Amor. So Mr. Amor, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Should I use that? All right. Yes, okay. It's great to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Jonathan E. Mord, and I'm a candidate for the U.S. Senate, of course. That's why I'm here. But I'm also a constitutional attorney and have been for the last 38 years. I came into Washington during the Reagan administration, worked at the FCC, and then after that, after during the period of deregulation of radio and TV. And then after that, I've served as a constitutional lawyer suing the government for the last 38 years. Now, I have the good distinction of having defeated the, the Food and Drug Administration eight times on constitutional grounds in federal court, and numerous other agencies of the federal government, including the Social Security Administration, the Bureau of Land Management, the D Drug Enforcement Administration, and others. Now, why is that important? Why is that important? It's important because we need someone who not only knows how to fight, but also knows how to win. And we need someone who also understands intimately the agencies of the federal government and how to defeat them. And why is that important? Because three quarters of all federal law is not the product of those we elect. It's the product of the unelected heads of over 250 different bureaus, agencies, and departments. Everything from the climate change agenda to the open border situation is run and implemented by these agencies. And so we have to get rid of the administrative state in America if we're to restore the Founding Fathers' Constitution. You know, we have one opportunity here to get it right. It's critical that we have an intimate knowledge of the Constitution and of the founding principles of this country and of the history of this nation to understand how to get back to the Founders Republic and how to save us from this headlong rush into socialism and communism. So it's my privilege to be here. I have 15 seconds to tell you that it's a great honor to be here, a great opportunity for us to all be here. And I hope that you'll gather from us enough information so that you can make that critical choice. And I hope that choice is me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lindahl. Please go ahead and take a seat. I'm going to invite Mr. Garcia. Eddie Garcia, please come. The floor is yours for two minutes opening speech. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eddie Garcia. 
uh, I'm the son of a ranch hand. I'm going to be brief because I got to. Uh, I'm the son of a ranch hand from South Texas. Uh, I don't come from much money. I, I got a working class background. I got a working class message for working class people. I spent uh, 22 years of my life in service to this nation in the U.S. Army. I, I jumped out of airplanes for 16 years. I graduated the U.S. Army Ranger School. I deployed to combat three times to Iraq, three times to Afghanistan. I'm a servant of the nation. I finished my career in the Pentagon, working at the federal level with the House and the Senate on behalf of our veterans and our military. And I got to tell you, during that time, well, I've come to one realization is that we need a government that works for all Americans, not just the politically connected. And so I stand here as the son of a ranch hand, as a veteran, not a lawyer, not a lobbyist, not a DC consultant, not a PAC manager. It's time that we build a coalition here in Virginia to win. There's no shortage of people, and you'll hear it tonight, that tell you all the things that we can't do, all the things that they won't do, all the things they're going to fight, fight, and stop. I'm going to tell you about the things that we can do. We can secure our borders. We can give school choice to our parents. We can protect our seniors. We can save Social Security. We can get our veterans off the streets. We can keep our seniors in our homes. Our government should work for us. Right now, it works for the small few that are connected across that river. It's time to change that. You're looking at the change agent. To win elections here in 2024, we're going to have to be the exact opposite of what we've seen in the past. So I'm a little bit younger than most. I got a little bit of a different message than most, but that's okay because we're in different times than we've seen in the past and so I ask for your support I'm excited that you're gonna be here uh, I ask that you if you took a sticker there in the back and the point in which I think that I win you over go ahead and throw that Garcia sticker on and show me that you're supporting uh, it's important this year that we win and to do that we're gonna have to do it in a different way than we've ever seen before and so I stand here I ask for your support and I'm excited to answer your questions so God bless you thank you Mr. Garcia I'm going to invite Mr. Parkinson to give the opening remark. All right, who's fired up and ready to win and defeat Tim Kaine in 2024? It is great to be here. I live just a short ways away in North Arlington, East Falls Church community, and I see so many familiar faces. It brings a big smile to my face. I even see some people that are members with me at Cherrydale Baptist, my good friends, the Spittlers. And honestly, this is all about our community fighting back and saving our country. We know what's in front of us. And I think that Governor Yunkin gave us the blueprint to actually win in 2024. We know that the race is gonna come down to the cost of living in the economy. It's gonna come down to public safety and fighting the illegal immigration crisis, closing our Southern border. And we know that it's also gonna come down to parents' rights and making sure that we're a voice for our children inside the classroom. But the Democrats, they're gonna lie, they're gonna cheat, they're gonna gaslight us. We see it each and every single day, not just from Joe Biden, but also from Tim Kaine. And so we need to make sure that we can build a winning coalition all together. You know, in Fairfax County, Governor Youngkin got more votes out of that locality than any other locality in the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. Some people say, well, he got 85% down in Southwest. This is a statewide race. We gotta put up those votes. So after you get to hear from all of us today, and I wanna also commend Jonathan and Eddie and Chuck for showing up, because it's important for us to show up and earn your support. Today we're going to make promises, and my promises are going to be based off of principles. I'm a constitutional conservative that believes in a limited government, and our rights have been infringed upon for far too long. But during COVID, when they came after us for our First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendment rights, we know that it's time to fight back. I'm Scott Parkinson, scottparkinson.com. Thank you, Mr. Parkinson. Let me invite Mr. Smith, Chuck Smith, to take the floor and start with your opening remarks. God bless all of you. Thank you so much for coming. This is a wonderful event. My name is Chuck Smith. I'm a candidate for the United States Senate. We've got to get our country back. I'm a constitutional lawyer that's practiced law for 45 years. I believe in America. I believe in the Founding Fathers. I believe in God, Almighty, Maker of Heaven and Earth, in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. I believe in we, the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union. You see, it's be precisely because I believe that you can count on me 
to stand for America, stand for Virginia, and by the grace of God, come hell or high water, no matter what, stand and endorse Donald J. Trump as the next president of the United States of America, and never let him down. If you're looking for courage, how about a Marine 0311 grunt ground pounder? If you're looking for integrity, how about a Navy JAG commander who retired after 26 years of combined military service? You're looking for our type of loyalty, Republican loyalty. How about the former chairman of the largest Republican Party city committee in the Commonwealth of Virginia? If you're looking for experience, how about someone who's practiced constitutional law, military law, and immigration law longer than anyone who's ever run for statewide office in Virginia in Virginia's 400-year history? We've got to get our country back. We've got to get our values back, because if we don't, we're going to be out of touch, out of seat, out of bounds, lost, like some ship floating aimlessly through the night. But not me, because I know, I know that Abraham Lincoln, who lost an election for eight, eight consecutive times, he did not quit. Like Chuck Smith, he did not give up. Like Chuck Smith, he did not turn around, and he did not surrender. I want to make sure that we get our country back. I want to stand for you. I want to be your United States Senator to put teeth teeth back into Congress. Thank you all. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I'm going to give you all a hold on to the mic. Before we even start, give a pat for yourself in the back. This is house full. And I've gone to a couple of Senate forums, and we have maybe 20, 70, 80 people at the most. Give yourself a pat in the back to have spend this evening with all of us and with the, this distinguished candidate. That being said, we are going to go to the first question. We will stop in this round, the same question for all four of you. And each of you have two minutes. Keep looking at Rosie, that you're reaching the 30 second limit. And the order has been determined based on your last name. Mr. Gilmore, you will go first, followed by Mr. Garcia, then Mr. Parkinson, and finally Mr. Smith. If this is easy to remember, but as you go along, I'll kind of remind you all. All right, the question goes as this. The Democrats, as you know, can't run on their records. All they have is to attack and demonize the distinguished candidates and Republicans and conservatives. How are you going to define yourself before they do? Because they will do, they will attack. They have started attacking all of you already in a way that will bring you victory in November. What will you do to expose Senator Tim Kaine's optimal record? How are you going to define yourself? So, thank you. Yeah. All, right, all right, so it's critically important that we have this definition. And what we need to do is to establish ourselves as those who believe in securing the borders, ensuring law and order, making sure that our kids in school are not subject to this whole woke agenda, ensuring that kids are not transitioned, making that a federal felony, ensuring that we stand for the Constitution and the rights of the American people, because they represent everything that is the opposite. Tim Kaine has, from the ignominious retreat from Afghanistan, he was on the Foreign Affairs Committee, he had full access to the intelligence necessary to know that this would result in a disaster, removing the Americans first, removing the, the troops first and leaving Americans and allies behind, leaving $16 billion on the ground. Did he do one thing. Did he object to the president? Did he introduce any legislation to change that? Not a thing. Not a thing. When it comes to the whole climate change agenda, which is a massive inflationary trillion dollar thing we have to repeal, that thing, that thing, did he support it? Yes, he did. Did he attack Virginians who are involved in the production of oil and natural gas and coal? Yes, he did. Did he say he wouldn't do that? Yes, he did. Does he deceive Virginians? He does. We have to be on the attack against Tim Kaine, relentlessly. He is a perfect target environment. This man from the open borders, did he do anything to solve the border crisis? Nothing at all. Did he vote in favor of every piece of legislation to expand human processing and allow welfare benefits to be given to illegal aliens? Yes, he did. Is he in favor of even supporting this whole uh, horrendous situation that we have now in the country, which is an army of illegal aliens on welfare variously and forming an underground economy taking jobs from Americans? Yes, he is in favor of that. So simply put, relentless attack. He will have to answer. They can call us any name they want. But we are going to keep him on the defensive. This is how we win. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. This is a great question because that's what y'all are here for. 
Yes, I can. All right, I will do that. Thank you. So basically my question was, the Democrats can't run on their record. They keep attacking the candidates. Our goal is to for them to be able to define themselves because, uh, because Democrats, if we don't uh, define them, or the candidates don't take the time to define themselves, Democrats will do that for them, which is not a great thing. So that was my first question. In addition to that, I asked uh, how are they going to uh, expose Senator Tim Kaine's worst record. Is that audible? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Garcia. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why you are here. Y'all are here to take a look at these candidates, myself included, and determine which one of these guys can beat Tim Kaine. Which one of these guys is the exact opposite of Tim Kaine? Which one of these guys uh, destroys the narrative of the left and who Republicans are? Don't forget, they're going to attack every single one of us. Who, who, what do they say Republicans are? They say we're, we're, we're out of touch. They say that we're old. They say that we're wealthy. They say that uh, we can't relate to working men and women, and they use it against us. The last thing we want to do is, is elect somebody or nominate somebody who feels all the things that they said. So I'm standing here in front of you, the son of a ranch hand who wants to work for working people. I, I come from a, a servant's background. I think that we got to have paint a clear contrast to somebody like Tim Kaine. You can even imagine him standing right next to me if you want to with his crazy hair and his bushy eyebrows, his crooked smile and say, and, and then look at me and say, hey, we're, who, which one of these people represents Virginia 2024 and which one of these represents Virginia 1994? This is a this is a clear cut contrast between the past and the future. I'm standing here in front of you telling you that I represent a new generation of conservatives, people who want to be reached out to, people who want to be inspired, people who want to be a part of something good that want to achieve what I call that better, this better tomorrow, one where we have a government that works for all of us, that can relate to all of us. And I'm going to be strong here in Virginia. I'm going to be strong with young people. I'm 42 years old. I'm in the prime of my life. Uh, I got a message for young people that are coming out of college that are finding it difficult in this economy. I'm going to be strong with veterans because I'm a 22-year Army veteran who's got a veteran-centric message. I'm going to be strong with what I call new Americans, people who have come here the right way, people who have wanted to see their, their families and their kids succeed. They want their kids in good education. They want to achieve the American dream. I believe I'm living that American dream as I stand here in front of you. I'm proof, living proof, that in America you can come from some place next to nowhere with next to nothing and be running for one of the highest offices in the land with a message that's positive in 2024, that builds and doesn't divide, uh, that builds up and doesn't tear down. So thank you guys. Like I said in my opening remarks, Governor Youngkin gave us the blueprint to winning, and that's what this race is all about. Tim Kaine's record is so radical and extreme, he's completely lost touch with the people of Virginia. I believe that we need a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that starts with pledging term limits. I'm not going to be a career politician. I am the youngest in the race. I'll be 42 this summer. I'm 41 right now. But I've got 18 years experience having worked for three US senators and serving as a senior staffer in the House of Representatives. I am going to adjudicate Tim Kaine's record. We're going to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, which he admitted just last week wasn't about it reducing inflation. He called it the greatest climate change piece of legislation in our nation's history. They're starting to tell you the truth, so listen to them when they do. But they also are going to lie and gaslight us. As candidates, I was attacked on April 3rd, 2023, the day that I announced. They said Scott's a MAGA extremist that wants to restrict a woman's right to an abortion. And they said that I wanted to repeal Obamacare. And they said that I supported school choice. Well, I am pro-life. And you know what? I've also read the Dobbs case. The Dobbs case says, the Dobbs case says that abortion shall be returned to the people's elected representatives. And so what that means is it's the precedent prior to Roe, which is where the states decided. So instead, let's go on offense and let's take Tim Kaine on for his extreme position, which is abortion all the way up to birth and infanticide after birth, the same position that Governor Northam shares. We've got to fight back. We've got to take off the handcuffs. Don't fight with one hand behind your back. 
take Tim Kaine on directly. That's what I intend to do as a candidate. Let's build the coalition of Trump and Yunkin, traditional conservatives, the establishment, independents, and some soft Democrats that no longer have a political base. So I can't wait. I can't wait for them to define me as a white supremacist. <laughs> I can't wait for them to say, I don't love the Constitution. I can't wait for them recognizing this guy was born on the 4th of July to say that he doesn't love America. We have to begin getting our country back. You know, Donald Trump said that we are our worst enemy. We are our worst enemy. And in a lot of contexts, perhaps you could see it differently, but the way I see it is that we have to stop saying one thing in Washington, D.C., and something else in Bristol, saying one thing in Virginia Beach and something else somewhere else. If, if we are pro-life, if we are pro-Constitution, if we are pro-vision, pro-values, why do we compromise in the United States Senate? They will find in me someone who will not compromise on fundamental values. I am pro-life, I am pro-God, I am pro-faith, I am pro-children, I am pro-term limits. These are the messages that have to go out to Washington. These are the messages that we need to start out of the gate running with. If you believe in this Constitution, nearly every problem that we have can be resolved if we get back to the Constitution. Remember, the founders only had 10 amendments. Only had 10 amendments. We need to get back to the values that we have. We don't have constitutional rights just because it's not raining. We don't have Second Amendment rights just because no one has gotten killed. We don't have rights in this government right now, we are not a nation with a government. The government thinks we are. We have to turn this ship around. As your United States Senator, I will remind people that there is such a thing called the Tenth Amendment. All power, all of it, every single ounce of it, not specifically delegated to the federal government, nor prohibited by it to the states, is what? Reserved to the people. That's what we lead out on. And as Republicans, remember Lincoln used to remind us that we're all in this together. He said it this way, we do not strengthen the weak by weakening the strong, raise up the wage earner by tearing down the wage pay, help the poor by destroying the rich, or do for men and women permanently what they can and should do for themselves. We need to learn that. As your United States Senator, I will take that message to Washington. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. I'm going to go slow, all right? In this section, we are going to pose different questions to each candidate. And again, it's two minute responses. This time we are going to go with Mr. Garcia first. Mr. Garcia, what is your plan to restore America to a state of energy independence? Two minutes, sir. I put is forward. Is that question clear? All right, it's about America energy independence. I talk about an all-American energy plan. We need an energy plan here in America that focuses on America from with American resources dug by American hands and American jobs for American people. We got to drill. We got to use natural gas. We got to use coal right here in Virginia. We have people that are uh, that are under attack by the Biden administration. We cannot sacrifice today for the future. That's what the left would have us do. They want to sacrifice all our fossil fuels for a, a, an imaginary future. But we cannot sacrifice the future for today, and we cannot sacrifice today for the future. So we do have to have an energy plan for the future. Uh, I talk about a, a national nuclear energy plan, very similar to what we do right here in Virginia. Right here, Virginia has two nuclear energy plants, uh, one in Lake Anna, one in Surrey, on a relatively small footprint. We power roughly a third of the Commonwealth's energy. We need to duplicate that across the lower 48 states. We need, uh, we need millions of jobs that are created by Americans, for Americans, and bring our energy costs down and sustainable for the long-term future. What that's going to do is it's going to put millions of people back to work, but it's also going to reduce the cost of energy for all of our citizens. It's going to get us off of Middle Eastern oil and gas, uh, so it'll keep us out of Middle Eastern endless wars. It'll keep us away from Chinese minerals that are being dug up right now in, in, in Africa. It's a win. It's a win for everybody, but instead, we have a Washington, D.C. that's padding their pockets, pretending that they're solving these energy crises for the future, and they're not. They take in all of our money, they put it into their pockets, they enrich their friends, they give subsidies to the people that don't need them. Meanwhile, we have people in, in Virginia that are being uh, put out of jobs. 
It's time that we have a government that works for us. If you're in D.C., if you're a Middle Eastern sheikh or crown prince, if you're a, a, a Ukrainian oligarch, our federal government works great for you. But if you live in the Southwest, if you're a farmer and rancher in the Valley, our government could care, couldn't care less. It's time to change it. When I get in office, you're going to have an advocate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. I know all our sons, grand, uh, daughters, granddaughters, and grandsons are now starting to graduate. So this is a question to Mr. Parkinson about colleges and universities. As you know, Mr. Parkinson, colleges and universities across the country, including here in Virginia, which Governor Youngkin stopped some of those uh, protests, are allowing these protests. Anti-Semitism is happening suppressing conservative speech and engaging in ideological indoctrination. So what do you propose if you are in Senate? What are you going to do to ensure that universities uphold the First Amendment and educate our children rather than indoctrinate them? Thank you for the question. You know, the first thing that I think you need to do as a United States Senator is completely condemn anti-Semitism. We have seen what has happened to the people of Israel with the brutal attack by Hamas, a terrorist attack. And now it's made its way to our university system where we're seeing out of control, rioting and violent protests in the universities. There's a few things that the universities care about, right? Money is one of them. And you know who pays full tuition rates? Foreign students, okay? and you think about the visas that they come over on, if they're caught committing a criminal act on our campuses, we should revoke those student visas and we should send them back. And if the universities continue to indoctrinate our children, you know what else we can do? We can take away their endowment preferences on the tax side. You know, you've got to get their attention through money. The billion dollar endowments at Harvard and Yale and Columbia, they care a lot about that. And I think that they'll start to listen to a US Senator when you start introducing legislation and using the bully pulpit as a US Senator to go after those colleges and universities. The other thing that's so important is the work that a United States Senator does as it pertains to executive branch nominations. And there's all sorts of nominees that go through the Department of Education which I think should be abolished. I want to see high quality K through 12 education that leads to productivity, higher wages, and workforce development in higher education. That means that we can uh, do workforce development in Hampton Roads and teach people how to be electricians and shipbuilders. We don't have to focus on people becoming philosophy majors. Thank you, Mr. Parkinson. This question is about securing the border. So, Mr. Smith, how do you secure the border and address millions of illegal immigrants who are pouring into a beautiful country, this American soil, during President Biden's regime? So, we are a nation of rules. We are a nation of laws. And as an immigration lawyer, I can tell you that I liken uh, illegal immigration and what's happening at our border to water overflowing in our tub. If water is overflowing in your tub, what do you do? Do you unplug the bottom so the water can drain out? Or do you turn the water off? As an immigration lawyer, I can tell you, you do both. We should stop all legal and illegal immigration in this country until we fix our border issue. It makes no sense to have a rule and no one is following it. I'm the one candidate that will tell you that we don't need new laws. We just need to enforce the laws we've got. What country can any of these people go to and parade and march on their streets and talk about how bad the country is that they're in? How is it that they're getting away with these things? As a United States Senator, I will bring to the forefront that if under any context, you're here on a visa, you're here on some type of temporary status, that status will be revoked immediately. And to the person in the back who said, what should happen to people when they violate our laws? They should go to jail. They should go to jail. We cannot continue 
putting Americans at risk, making every state a border state. We cannot continue doing the types of things that we should not be doing. Funding, our schools are overrun, our hospitals are overrun. You talk about eliminating the national debt, you talk about enforcing social security, all of these things. Why are we spending all of this money when now, 10 years ago, we had 11 million people. Now it's upwards of 20. When is this going to stop? When is the gun going to end? I say we need to get some sense in our immigration policies. We need to get some sense in the things that are going on in this country. And that's what I'm going to do as your United States Senator because it makes perfect sense to hold people accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. This question about bureaucracy that is happening in our government currently. So, Mr. Rebar, how does the U.S. Senate resent the power it has given over to the administrative state? And follow up question to that is, how do you ensure that unelected bureaucrats do not have crushing power over citizens like us, our lives, and our businesses? This is the one of the most important issues of our time. Uh, we have an administrative state that's making three quarters of all federal law. Now, the real problem is that it's wholly outside the Constitution's branches, and we don't have checks and balances. We have an inadequate system of control. and. They are making all of government's regulations that control us. What do we need to do? I wrote a bill for Congressman Ron Paul, who's endorsed my candidacy many years ago, called the Congressional Responsibility and Accountability Act. And this is what it does. Every proposed regulation has no legal force or effect unless passed into law by Congress. This, thank you. This restores the separation of powers. In Article I, Section 1 of the Constitution, only Congress can make the law. In addition, it sunsets all existing regulations within three years unless passed into law by Congress. Now, when it comes to our rights, if you have a problem with the government, you are going to interact most likely with an administrative agency. And what you're going to find out is that in an administrative court, you're presumed guilty until you prove yourself innocent. It's a kangaroo court. You don't have a right to a jury trial, even if they take your property or your liberty away. You don't have a right against self-incrimination. You don't have a right to discovery against the government, but the government has a right of plenary discovery against you. It's actually called an administrative warrant, which was held unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment in court because the Fourth Amendment abolished it. The Founding Fathers were dead set against it. This is a part and parcel of what we see with the administrative state. It is grinding away the free market. It is destroying our rights and privileges under the Constitution. And it is doing so to advance the interests of special interests. We have got to gain control over this, and we can. And the legislation I talked about is the first step. The second is to abolish the administrative courts, to make the agencies go to the Article Three courts to pursue their actions against somebody where our rights are protected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Omar. Looks like all of us have warmed up now with all the technical difficulties of mic and my accent. So I'm going to slow down and ask this essay question. It's a lengthy question. And each candidate will have five minutes to respond to this. If you need me to repeat the questions, please don't hesitate to ask. All right, we are going to go ahead and get started uh, with Mr. Parkinson this time. Again, it is five minutes, so take your time. So questions are, what is the issue that drove you to run and put yourself through grueling process at 41, for God's sake? And then, what pressing issues as you're campaigning are Virginians asking you to solve? What specific legislation would you bring to the floor of the Senate to address those issues. Question is clear? Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you, Mr. Parkinson. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, so I'll start out with why I'm running. Everybody here remembers Friday the 13th, March 2020. That was when the economy started to shut down. I was watching TV at my house. The National Basketball Association season was suspended indefinitely. And I couldn't believe what was going on. There was all this fear that swept America. And that next Monday, and for nine straight weeks, we lost over a million jobs every week in the economy. It was 14 million jobs throughout our entire country. And that was all self-inflicted. We saw people getting uh, furloughed. We saw people having to do virtual work. We saw the schools get closed. We saw our churches get closed. 
We saw our First Amendment rights get infringed upon, the right to free speech. Think about if you said that hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin were safe drugs, right? You'd be censored by big tech. Think about if uh, you, know, you want a free press, right? One of the other rights underneath the First Amendment. The press was pushing propaganda from the coronavirus task force and the legacy media went with it. And then you think about the right to peaceably assemble, right? You couldn't peaceably assemble on the Capitol. If we would have taken 200 people there, you know what would have happened to us? There would have been tear gas, there would have been handcuffs, we'd have all been thrown in jail. Okay, what about the right to petition government for redress of grievances? The Capitol had walls put up all around it. And the only way to get inside was if a staffer or a member of Congress escorted you in. That's not a free and open government that we demand as a free people. Then I think about what I believe is the most important right underneath the First Amendment, the establishment and exercise of our religious freedom. The CDC and the FDA put out all this guidance that the states looked at and forced the shutdowns and closures of our churches, of our schools, and of our economy. And I became so frustrated because having worked on Capitol Hill for a long time, I put my trust in these elected leaders that fell into the trap and the contagion of fear. You needed more people with courage because courage is also contagious. Who's gonna stand up and fight for us is what I began to pray about. And so after the 2022 election, my wife and I we're still very, very discouraged. And we prayed about it. We met with our church leaders. We met with our friends and family. And I decided to start to test the waters. Over six weeks, I met and, and spoke with over a thousand people. And there was this growing consensus that yes, Tim Kaine is vulnerable. Yes, Governor Yunkin did give us the blueprint. Yes, Donald Trump is going to win re-election in 2024. Some people said, Scott, you're only 41. You're right. Why are you doing this now? We don't have 10 years left to save our country. So some of the other big issues that I deeply care about is our nation's debt and deficit situation. We are dealing with a trillion dollar deficit as far as the eye can see. Our net interest payments are over a trillion dollars annually, and that exceeds the entire Pentagon's budget. And I think that that's a real problem. I think that that's actually a threat to our national security and our national defense. So legislation that I will certainly support would be a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. I think that it's important that the American people have a government that lives by the same rules as them, the kitchen table rules of balancing the budget. But instead, we rush to omnibus appropriation bills that are over a thousand pages long, and the report language is over 2,000 pages long. And they say, you've got 26 hours to read the bill before we've got to pass it. And it sounds funny, but it's terrifying because this is the way that our government operates. And I think that it is a thousand percent unacceptable. It's on each and every single one of us to try to join together and put the pressure on the Congress. Instead, they say, well, this bill includes, you know, the senator from West Virginia's number one priority, and here's a priority for the senator from Alaska. But it's not about parochial interests. It's what's best for America. And I think that we need to restore our economy. We'll provide for taming in inflation because right now, those higher costs are being felt by middle income families all across our great commonwealth. We live in Nova where most people here are pretty well off, but when you get down 30 miles outside of Nova, people are feeling that pinch. Thank you, Mr. Parkinson. We're going to move to Mr. Smith now. Mr. Smith, just to repeat the question, and it's a long question. What is the issue that drove you to run? And what is what pressing issues are our commonwealth or genius asking you to solve and what uh, uh, specific legislation would you bring to the floor? Donald Trump. In God's name, where are the fighters? Where are the Republicans? Where are the people that stand up for the First Amendment? You, you, you go to the Capitol 
and they put barbed wires around the Capitol so that you can't. Where in the Constitution does it say that you can do do that? Uh, people are tearing down statutes, uh, uh, tearing down statutes that, mind you, they do not own. And nothing is being done. Where are elected officials? Where are the fighters? My grandmother, um, I, how many people were raised by their grandmother? Okay. Uh, I was raised by my grandmother. My, my, my mother had substance abuse issues. My grandmother said, I'm going to step in. And she took care of me. And uh, my mother was a school teacher. She taught school for 30 years. Father was a school teacher. And so they delivered me on the 4th of July and went back to college uh, to teach, teach college. My grandmother said, no, 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 I'm going to step in. Then my mother had substance abuse issues. And my grandmother said, no, leave Chucky with me. And so I went everywhere. She went to church, I went to church. She, she went to choir practice, I went to choir practice. She went to usher board meeting, I went to usher board meeting. Uh, she used to sit me on the front row of the church and said, you sit right here because I can see you if you get in any trouble. But what she didn't count on is that it stuck. It, it, it took. I, I, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know. I would, I would hum that at night. Uh, you know, for the Bible tells me so. One day after high school, my friends would get out and they would go home. I went uh, downtown and I came home. My grandmother, she was in the yard and she loved herself, Chucky, and I loved her too. Uh, she was in the yard on her knees and she was happy as can be. She looked up and I said, Mama, I called her Mama, I said, Mama, I gotta tell you something. Uh, this is 1970, all right? June 1970, G.I. Jane, our people coming home in body bags, no one wanting to go to war, people dodging the draft. I come home and I said, Mama, she said, Chucky, where have you been? Mama, I was downtown. I walked downtown. I joined the military service. And she stopped. And she turned around. You could see her eyes were bloodshot red. And, and with tears falling in her eyes, she gave me a big hug. She stood up and gave me a hug and said, Chucky, whatever you do, whatever you do, stay on that damn ship. Stay on that damn ship. <laughs> and, and I said, I had to tell her. I said, Mama, I didn't join the Navy. I joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> because I was a fighter. I wanted to fight. I heard there was something going on in Vietnam. I heard that people were being killed. People were dying. I wanted to fight. Listen, I'm an only child. And I'm the only children here. Uh, as an only child, you, you can't rely on anyone else but yourself. You're, you're playing with your little army men. You have to be the enemy and you have to be the union camp. You have to be everyone. I'm that person. If something needs to be done, I have to do it. I've run for office before and I've lost. Oh, that energized me more. I run again and I lo that energized me more. But this race here, this one is too important. They have run over our Constitution. We can't find the Republicans. The ones we find, the ones we find, are not keeping their word. And as to laws that I would, I, we, don't, we don't need any more laws. We have all the laws. You want to practice uh, uh, attacking people on college campuses verbally or physically, we have a law for that. You want to, 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 to raise the national debt when you know you don't have money? We, we have a law. We have a regulation against that. We need to enforce the laws we've got. And I'm telling you, as a believer and as a constitutionalist, there is a law to hold people accountable when they try to keep a former president off the ballot. Have they forgotten innocent until proven guilty? I want to fight for that issue. Have they forgotten the due process of law, the due process of law clause? It's not just that. What, what about the Second Amendment? Where are the people standing up for our rights to bear arms? How, look, how about the Ninth Amendment? People want to talk about, oh, we, God doesn't exist. God exists. And, and it's not my job to force God on you. All I'm saying that when the founders founded this country, they wrote right in the Ninth Amendment that just because we number one through ten, that doesn't take away rights retained by the people. I'm fighting for those rights. I want to stand up for those values. And I'm sorry. If I can't find a Republican to do it, I will run for the United States Senate, Senate myself. We have to get this done. I think we're in critical mass. We lose this election. We're in, we're in a world of trouble. You know they want to open the Constitution. You know they want to change the Constitution. I, I, I think we need term limits. But I'd be doggone if I'm going to open the Constitution while there's a Democrat around because they'll run right through that and change everything. Why do we compromise on fundamental values? Why do we compromise on principles? I'm in this race because I'm a fighter. I believe in fighting. I believe in re representing you. I believe in standing up for you. When I went to the Marine Corps, no one had to tell me twice. I was off and gone. That's the type of senator I'm going to be. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Speck.
So uh, when I was watching the rioting taking place all across the country, 500 police being killed by Antifa, BLM rioting. You want to hear the question again? The question is three parts. You want me to summarize it? Yes. The first part of the question is, why, why did, what caused you to decide to run? Second question is, uh, what are the issues the people in Virginia identify you as most important? The third one is, how are you going to solve it, basically? Okay. All right. So we have, and do I, can I have a uh, reserve that time? Thank you very much. So here I am, uh, just like all of you, just totally upset by the fact that, look, where's the law enforcement? Why aren't they arresting these people engaging in arson and destruction of churches and ruination of government buildings and on and on and on? Where are the police? Why is there no law enforcement? What's going on? And I talked to Dan Burton, who is the head of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. He retired from Congress. He's been a good friend of mine since I testified before his committee in favor of the Access to Medical Treatment Act that I, that I wrote for, Cong for uh, Congressman Ron Paul. And he said, you know what, Jonathan, why don't you run for the United States Senate? And I said to him, absolutely not. I said, look, the last thing in the world I want to do is go into that swamp. I go to Capitol Hill every now and again, and I deeply regret it. Because when I go there, I feel like I have to take two showers, okay? <laughs> I, I, I do not want to do that. And he said something very profound, which really inspired me to do this. He said, Jonathan, I served over 25 years in Congress. I put the best that I have into it. And here's where we are. I'm 83 years old. I can't do this again. But if good people who know what they're doing, who understand the Constitution and are willing to fight to save this country, don't get into government now, it's over. And he said, I hate to put the guilt trip on you, Jonathan, but think about your children and think about your families and think about your community and think about this nation and forget about yourself. And you know what? He was absolutely right, and that's why I'm running. Now, what do people in Virginia tell me are the issues that are most important to them? Over and over again, it's the open borders, it's inflation, and it's crime, and it's the schools. So let's talk about these quickly. What am I going to do? On the border situation, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce legislation that will make it, a, it will make it impossible for you to enter, even put one foot in the United States to seek asylum. You are not going to be able to do that. I'm going to amend the asylum laws that require you to seek asylum in the United States Embassy in your country of origin or in an adjacent United States Embassy in an adjacent country, but not in the United States. And if you put one foot into the United States to seek asylum, we're going to permanently bar you from citizenship and subject you to immediate deportation. In addition, we're going to introduce, as a part of this legislation, we are going to, yes, complete border wall construction. But the third thing might surprise you. We are not going to put money in DHS. DHS under Alejandro Mayorkas has been ruined. We have layer after layer after layer of individuals who are globalists who support this agenda of Alejandro Mayorkas, which is to violate the immigration laws and to destroy this country. So what are we going to do? We're going to have block grants to the border states willing to defend the border. Those block grants are going to enable them to hire the police, the National Guard, and the State Guard necessary to police the border. And we are going to have to deal with the cartels. And you know what about the cartels? These are massive militaries. They are, in fact, criminal syndicates that are the size of nations. They're operating not only over there, but in our own country. And we're going to have to take them out and we're going to have to have military action, special forces to do it. Now, in addition to that, this issue, we got the issue of inflation. And how do we deal with the issue of inflation? I'll tell you. We repeal the climate change agenda. That saves us $1 trillion a year. In addition to that, we're going to have to reduce the size and scope of the federal government. We're going to have to get rid of the Department of Education, the Department of Energy. We're going to have to get rid of the Department of Commerce. We're going to have to downsize the federal bureaucracy. We're going to get rid of the Federal Trade Commission. Ronald Reagan wanted to do it. He was right then. It's been an absolute ruin to free market enterprise in this country. We're going to get rid of it. And we're going to reduce the size and scope of the government with that bill that I mentioned, the Congressional Responsibility and Accountability Act. Now, 
Uh, I'll try to cover the remaining ones in 30 seconds. No. All right. So when it comes to inflation, also, we have to grow the economy, right? So we need to reduce taxes. This is what I favor, getting rid of the progressive income tax in favor of a flat tax, starting at $200,000 a year at 10% straight up. And then, I have 15 seconds left, on the issue of crime, I am in favor taking the Hobbs Act and expanding its enforcement to reach the Soros-backed prosecutors. And we're going to put them in jail. And we're also going to take... Do I get a second for claps? Okay. Uh, and what we're also going to do is expand criminal RICO so we can go after Soros and his entire operation in this country. He's an enemy of the United States. So you'll get a chance to speak and you'll get a chance to applaud as well. Mr. Garcia, please take the seat. Take the floor, please. I'm going to tell you a different story. I told you I'm the son of a ranch hand. My dad is a 63-year-old ranch hand uh, in South Texas. He works outside on somebody else's property six days a week, rain, sleet, or snow. Uh, he's, never, he's never made more than $55,000 a year. He has no pension. He has no retirement. He can't afford health insurance. He hadn't seen a doctor outside of an emergency room in a decade. My mother works at a grocery store. It's not one that she owns or manages. She gets up at 5.30 in the morning. She drives 40 miles. She puts on a warm coat. And she goes in the back of a sub-zero freezer and she cuts fruits. I tell you that story because after 22 years of service, to come back and see working people across Virginia, across America, struggling more today than two decades ago. While Washington has got more money, more power, more control over our lives than ever before, they keep growing and getting stronger and we keep shrinking and getting smaller. The, the power that is supposed to reside in the people is being taken away and it's not being taken away because of individuals like yourself. It's being taken away by the, the, by the DC elite by the lobbyists, by the big PACs, by the out-of-state donors, both on the left and the right. They're selling away our nation, and they're doing it to their friends. They're giving it to their friends and their family, and they're doing it right in front of us. They're doing it as they sit up here, bit by bit, piece by piece. It's important this year that we have a candidate that can withstand the swamp that is Washington, D.C., that's not enticed, that is a true servant of the nation, that hasn't enriched themselves off that corrupt system. Somebody who comes outside of that system, somebody who represents you. Friends, if we don't have a government that comes from us, we end up having a government that comes at us. Rather than having a government that works for us, right now we have one that works against us. And it's imperative this year that we elect somebody, that we nominate somebody that is free from scandals, that is free from the Washington hooks of big money that are outside of Virginia, that it can stand on his own two feet and make the case across Virginia about a better tomorrow where we introduce legislation that people across Virginia actually want introduced. The Republican Party would do very well if we just listened to the people that we want to vote for us. And for so long, that is just not the case. The Democrats, they got it down. They promised their constituents, and then they go do it. Republicans won't even promise to do anything anymore. They just tell you all the things they're not going to do. I tell you that we're going to secure the border. We're going to give universal school choice to our parents so that parents in Virginia and parents across America have the power and control and, most importantly, the money to educate their children how and when and where they see fit to include homeschooling. Because homeschooling will develop stronger families, more well-adjusted kids, stronger families equal stronger communities. We can do that at the federal level. A better tomorrow is one where we, uh, where we promote life from the very beginning until the very end. Dobbs has been decided, but at the federal level, we can help our expected moms. We can increase pregnancy centers. We can increase maternity services. We can incre increase adoption services. Pro-life is also end of life. So I pledge to introduce a bill that in eliminates taxes on all retirement accounts because end of life is pro-life. Thank you. If you 
put into a retirement system. I mean, if you got a 401k or an IRA, if you got a pension from a job that you work, that somebody invested, if you're on Social Security, if you're a military retiree and you're in a pension, the government has no business coming in and taxing you once you're a senior, once you're on a fixed pension. We have seniors right now across Virginia, across America that are being priced out of their homes due to rising costs, rising taxes, rising inflation, rising gas prices. And we have a government that's encouraging, making them take their money out and then taxing them off it. I don't believe it's right. I'm pro-life from the beginning to the end, and the end counts. I believe that we need uh, an America that works for us. It needs uh, leaders that can speak to the issues of today, that can hold the people accountable that have led our children astray. We have Marxist universities right now that get tax benefits uh, by the Washington elite that graduated from those universities. We got to go after them, but we got to we got to do it smartly. We got to do it in a way that builds uh, that people, that young people that are coming out of college can understand. They're the ones that are facing this economy. They're the ones that are saddled with that debt for a degree that can't get them a job. We have to be able to articulate this message to a population here in Virginia. Virginia is not Mississippi. It's not Texas. It's Virginia. There's more Democrats than Republicans. So you're going to have to have somebody who can articulate these things, not stumble through their words, that has a vision about growing the coalition that we need in order to win. So uh, my time is up, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. We're going to change it up just a bit. This is going to be a lightning round of audience questions, some of the questions that you have given us. I'll be asking the same question, and we have four questions. And you can kind of pass on the mic so each one, when the question is asked, you're not always the first person to answer. So kind of move around your mic. I am just looking for yes or no answers. Yes, sir. I have a question. I, yes. just, just following the rules. Uh, did, did the comment about scandals, does that affect one of us here? Because I think that person needs to respond. I don't think so. I heard someone in the back. Did the comment about, may I address? Yeah, sure. Did the comment about scandals, did that affect one of the people up here? Because if it did, then that person there, gets an opportunity to respond. There is no question about scandals at all. I said this is a lightning round. No, no. Okay, okay, all right, okay. No, this is I heard her scream. It was something, it was something, something that okay. one of the candidates, okay. yeah, Eddie said. But I think something that uh, one of the candidates said. So we're going to go back into lightning round. This is going to be actually a fun round. Again, as I said, uh, four questions uh, you have, and it is the same question for each of you. It is a yes or no answer, and you can mostly take 30 seconds if you feel like you want to elaborate on your yes or no. Right? Ready for it? All right, let's start with Mr. Parkinson. So that way you can rotate the mic. Again, same questions for every one of you, 30 seconds. And if you want to elaborate 30 seconds, otherwise it's basically yes or no. The first question is, do you support the immediate deportation of illegal immigrants? Yes, I do. I think that we need to deport the illegal immigrants that have poured across our border, make our communities less safe, and are a drain on our public health, public education, and law enforcement community. I think that it's incredibly important to make sure that we maintain American sovereignty on the southern border, and we shouldn't be incentivizing people with amnesty or a legal status when they've come here illegally. Thank you. Thank you. This is the same question. 100%. We cannot continue to maintain our laws while people are in violation of those laws. We can never get back to zero. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes or no question? He said, have a person. I believe yes. that's yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. We had someone ask it around here. All right, Mr. Lemore, same question, sir. I'm going to get them up and running, I guess. The answer is definitely right. yes. The answer is yes. We can't have a two-tiered system of justice in this country. We have to respect the rights of American citizens and those who have come here illegally. We cannot create a separate class of citizens that are illegally here but allowed to have the privileges of being an American citizen. We are not going to do it. Absolutely, we're going to have to deport them, and that is just. That is fair. That stands for the rights of Americans legally here. Thank you. Mr. Garcia. 
every person here illegally should be deported. Right now, we have uh, millions of people who are uh, who have who have not met the requirements of asylum. We have visa overstays. We have people that are uh, that that have crossed illegally, and each one of those people have to be returned to where they uh, where they originally came from. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Now the mic goes to Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, hold on to that. The question is. Do you support a constitutional amendment to balance the budget? No. Ah. Thank you. Mr. Limor. Question is, do you support a constitutional amendment to balance the budget? Okay. <laughs> the answer is no, but I think it deserves a response. Uh, I, I firmly believe that we don't need more laws. We just need to do our responsibility, and we can get there. But, um, uh, you know, the, the moment we make a new law, who's going to enforce that? The same people who should be already enforcing the laws that we have. Thank you. Mr. Raymond, again, do you support a constitutional amendment to balance the budget? Absolutely. We have to have this responsibility. We have to have a balanced budget. You know, there are exceptions in circumstances where our lives are at stake and we have to expend money. But to have a balanced budget that ensures that on an ordinary basis, the Constitution already provides that we are to have a budget process. And since 1996, Congress has not abided by that. Yes, do we need more? Yes, we need to ensure that there is a balanced budget process like there is in many states. And we need to have an actual budget review and we need to ensure that we do not exceed our receipts. Thank you, Mr. Government Mr. needs to be responsible. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Yes, we need to, I would be in favor of a balanced budget amendment because uh, everybody knows that your household can't survive if you spend more than you bring in. And right now we got a government that's spending out of control and our debt is a, is a national security issue. It affects everybody's lives and it's going to continue to for, for generations to come because we have a Washington uh, that is spending our money and giving it to themselves. So I, I answered this during my five-minute uh, essay, and yes, I support a balanced budget amendment. Government does not have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. So the balanced budget amendment to the Constitution that I support would prohibit tax increases as a way to get to balance. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. I'll ask Mr. Amor to take the mic. Would you support a constitutional amendment to codify the Supreme Court at nine seats? I'm going to repeat the question. Yes. Hopefully everyone is able to hear. Would you support a constitutional amendment to codify the Supreme Court at nine seats? You got it? I absolutely, absolutely would support an amendment to limit to nine members, and the reason is this. As a constitutional lawyer who's practiced in the federal courts year after year after year, I can tell you, nine is sort of a magic number, to tell you the truth. It ensures deliberation, but it minimizes the risk of factions. In addition, it does not cause a turnover in the court so that the Congress is constantly weighing in on the processes of the court. The court has to be independent. And if we had 10 or 20 or 30, what the Democrats are trying to do with court packing, this will give the legislature greater control to lord over what is supposed to be an independent judiciary. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Mr. Garcia. Yes, we have to keep nine. Yes, if we uh, came to that uh, conclusion, I would support a, a, an amendment to make sure that we keep nine justices. We cannot open this up uh, to the to the Marxists and to the big money, and that will ha would inevitably have influence over this process. It, it is important that we keep the nine that we have. It's important that we keep the Senate so that we can confirm uh, a good one when it comes up. Uh, that's where all of you guys come in. Thank you, Mr. Barson. Mr. Parkinson. Yes, I also support the constitutional amendment. It's something I've been campaigning on. There is a constitutional amendment to save nine proposed by Ted Cruz, senator from Texas, that's endorsed my campaign. Thank you. So I, I'm the guy that says we don't need more laws. We do not need to continue making laws. Why do we need a constitutional amendment to keep the court at nine 
when it has been established that it's at nine, it has never exceeded. Now, now you may say the Democrats, they've gone stock raving mad. Maybe they will get there and do that. But our job this election cycle with Donald Trump is to get this country back. We don't need to keep making more laws to have the people do the things they're supposed to be doing. And, and if, as, as Emor did, could I have just one more minute just to comment this? When, when my grandmother told me to go out to the yard to get the switch and I had to pull all the leaves off, I didn't get a second chance to do what I should have done in the first place. I got that spanking. We need to hold people accountable. Thank you, Mr. Smith. All right, let's give the mic to Mr. Garcia this time. All right, I'm going to again repeat the question twice. Do you support term limits for members of Congress? All of our favorite questions. Do you support term limits for members of Congress? Yes. Mr. Garcia, yes or no question? Yes, I have signed a term limits pledge. I believe that our government right now is run by a generation of people that have continued to, to grift off this system. We, we don't have a nobility in America, and we shouldn't. But if, if someone from another country took a look at our Washington, D.C., and the class of people that rule over us generation after generation, you wouldn't be able to tell. It's time for new leadership. It's time for new blood. It's time uh, to restore the greatness of America. The question was, do you support term limits? And yes, I do support term limits. On day one of my campaign, April 3rd, 2023, I signed the term limits pledge. It calls for three terms in the House and two terms in the Senate. I think that it's important to go up against these career politicians like Tim Kaine. But you can't support the career politicians on the right. So last summer, I also came out against Mitch McConnell remaining as the Republican leader of the United States Senate. We need new voices at the leadership table. Yes, 100%. All right, thank you. Absolutely. I signed the U.S. Term Limits Pledge. I can give you two justifications for that. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Thank you. All right, we're all getting fired up now. As we are getting fired up, this session is going to be about rapid fire individual questions. So you won't each get the, the same question, but you each will get different questions. Again, it is, it is 30 seconds only if you want to just elaborate. Otherwise, it is still yes or no questions. All right, let's start with you, Mr. Raymore, if you want to hold on to that mic. And again, I'll repeat the question twice. Do you support a law that would ban ownership and trading of individual stocks by members of Congress and their immediate families? This is about, think about Nancy Pelosi, you'll know about the question. Do you support a law that would ban ownership and trading of individual stocks by members of Congress and their immediate families? Yes, we need to stop these conflicts of interest and the self-dealing that's taking place in Congress. Mr. Garcia, you have a different question. Do you support giving money to Ukraine? The question to Mr. Garcia is, do you support giving money to Ukraine? The answer is no. I spent eight years in special operations in Europe. And I would tell you that as justification, we knew Russia could never do the things that they claimed to do, and we were okay with that. What Biden and Kane have done is they've emboldened Russia. They strengthened Russia. They've given them more power, more money. Uh, they, they've rebuilt their own military industrial complex. Their commanders on the ground have two years of wartime experience. Uh, we have drastically gone in the wrong direction. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Mr. Parkinson. Do you support financial and military backing for Israel? This question is about financial and military backing for Israel. I'm asking the candidate if he will support or not. Yeah, I strongly support Israel. I think that we need to make sure that they've got all the coordinate they need to defend themselves. Obviously, the Iron Dome did what it was supposed to do, right? It shot down most of those 300 unmanned drones and missiles that were shot by the Iranians. But you know what else happened? We had a coalition of international partners and allies that also stepped up to protect Israel. And it wasn't just the United States. It also included Jordan and Saudi Arabia. So I strongly stand with Israel. Thank you. The question is for Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, do you support giving more money to the UN? The question is about giving more money to the UN. Yes or no? 
I think they've already answered the question. Okay, he's talking, I don't know why. Uh, absolutely not. I know this is rapid fire, but absolutely not. I, I follow Trump's, uh, Trump, Donald Trump's statement. People who are brought to Washington to talk bad about this country, I'm sorry, brought to New York to talk bad about this country should never come in the first place. Exactly. Mr. Mike, we can up two easy questions. Let's make it a little tough this time. Mr. Rimor, would you support using our military to enforce our northern and southern border security? Yeah. The question is, would you support using our military to enforce our northern and southern borders? Yes. Yeah. The cartels are really a problem, and they're entirely military operations. It takes a military to take them out, and they need to be taken out. Yeah. Mr. Garcia, do you support a law about adding a citizenship question to the census, yes. which would reappropriation congressional seats based on citizenship instead of population. Yes. I'm going to repeat the question. First is, do you support a law adding a citizen, citizenship question to the census, which would reappropriate congressional seats based on citizenship instead of population? The answer is yes. Uh, the, the representatives should be represented or representing American citizens. So uh, just bringing in illegals and counting them towards the census in order to get more representatives in California, for instance, yeah. is the exact wrong answer. Uh, our representatives represent American citizens, and that's the way it should stay. All right, Mr. Parkinson, your question is, the World Health Organization has proposed a pandemic treaty which gives control of U.S. citizens if a pandemic has been declared. Do you support that treaty? Based no, of course not. I thought you said these questions were going to get hard. <laughs> I thought so too. Yeah. Listen, uh, what happened during the pandemic is just totally outrageous. And the pressure that you're uh, having from these alphabet soup organizations on the American people, I think is unconstitutional. We need to defend American sovereignty and that extends into pandemics. All right. Do you support voter ID for federal elections? 100%. Voter One, ID for federal elections? 100%, yes. Thank you. I'm going to go with Mr. Imar. Do you believe we still have free and fair elections in the U.S.? Question is, do you believe we still have fair and free elections in the U.S.? Just so you know that, if the questions are getting easier, these are audience questions. So you asked for it, I'm just reading up. I'm, the, I'm just a messenger, don't shoot me on it. All right. Do you believe we have free and fair elections in the no, US? We, we have widespread corruption and we need to deal with that. And I don't know if I have more time, but yes. We need to deal with that, and if we don't, this is going to be the undoing of our country for sure. We cannot allow this fraud that's taking place in the elections. We cannot allow it. If you are elected, what will you do to eliminate election interference? What will you do to eliminate election interference is the question for Mr. Garcia. I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take it dip. It's on. Okay. I'm going to take a different approach than, uh, than probably what you're used to. Absolutely. We need to reform the way we do elections. And the first thing we do is take big money out of politics. We have these PACs and these billionaires on the left and the right that buy our candidates, they buy our elections, they buy our airwaves, and they take the power away from you. We need to eliminate this big money, this dark money, where we don't know where it comes from and who it's backed by. I'm the only candidate that's talking about it. If we're ever going to give power back to the people in our elections, this is how we do it. There's way too much money and it's unaccountable it's even in here in this election to right now that you're having the vote on uh, i ask you to support me in that effort thank you mr garcia all right mr parkinson would you support a law requiring an independent third party audit of the vote in each state before certification i'm going to repeat the question would you support a law requiring an independent third party audit of the vote in each state before recertification or before certification? 
honestly, it sounds a little unconstitutional. And I'm just being honest with everybody, right? The way that I heard the description of the law, the states are supposed to administer their own elections. Now, I do believe that there are some federal reforms that are necessary to strengthen election integrity. I support the SAVE Act, which would require U.S. citizenship upon registration. I think that those are the kind of reforms that are important. I'm just not sure I feel comfortable infringing upon the state's rights to administer their elections. And let's go on to the question, so I'm going to repeat the same question to you. Um, would you support a law requiring an independent third party audit of the vote in each state before recertification or before certification? No, I would not. I, I, I firmly believe that we have those laws now. We need to enforce the, look, if, 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 if these machines are connected to the internet, therein is your fraud. Who connected the machine to the internet? We need to disconnect the machines from, from the internet. We need to hold people responsible. We don't need to keep making and making and making new laws for someone else to enforce. We have those laws now. As your United States Senator, I will hold people accountable. People need to be afraid. You cannot continue to do the things you're doing right now and have no accountability. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. All right. I am still going to be asking audience questions. A lot of questions came in. Thank you for your engagement. This is also going to be one of those quick yes or no answers. But this time, it is going to be the same question for all four of you. So please continue to pass on the mic. Again, if you want to take 30 seconds extra, feel free to take it. But that's about it, because we all want to be right out on time. So we'll start with Mr. Amor. The question is, as you know, Virginia's number one industry is agriculture. Would you support federal food and farm freedom bills? The question is, as we know, Virginia's number one industry is agriculture. Would you support federal food and farm freedom bills? Yes. Thank you. Please pass it on. Yes, we have to protect our farmers and ranchers. I've been, I spent a lot of time in the valley in the southwest. I got to tell you, uh, we, we got to protect them. Through, we have to pass a farm bill. We have Republicans with big money that don't want to pass a farm bill. I'm not one of those guys. If we can't grow our food, we can't be a country. And so we got people right now, we got farmers and ranchers that are being squeezed by our government and they're being enticed by these multinational uh, corporations, BlackRock and Stank Street, and they're buying up our farmlands. They're trying to, uh, they're trying to, All right. All right. Okay, let's not interrupt our candidates while they're speaking. No, Mr. Garcia, please. You get 30 extra seconds. Let's give him 30 extra seconds for being interrupted. There you go, sir. Thank you. Uh, the woman does have a point. The, the Chinese are buying up our farmlands. They're doing it through corporations like BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard. We have a federal government that are squeezing the profits of our farmers, and they're being enticed to sell to these corporations. And those same corporations come right back to the politicians and ask for subsidies in order to, to enrich themselves. They throw solar panels on their farmland. And once they do, we lose that farmland for a generation, for 100 years. We have to stop it. I will protect our farmers and our ranchers. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Same question to Mr. Parkinson. Yes, I support farmers, and yes, of course, I support agriculture. It's honestly a part of the foundation of America. And obviously, I'd want to see the details of legislation, but farm freedom sounds like a pretty darn good thing. We, of course, need to make sure that American citizens own American farmland, too. Thank you. Rapid, rapid fire, 100%. Thank you. Let the mic go to Mr. Garcia at this time. Next question. Do you support central bank digital currencies? The question is, do you support central bank digital currencies? No. No. I do not. I do not support central bank digital currencies. I do support uh, crypto and individuals that, that, that want to invest uh, to, to protect themselves from this inflationary government with this Fed and the money printing. Uh, there's a need for that, but the government has no business in it, and ne none of us should want that. Thank you. Mr. Parkinson. I strongly oppose the central bank digital currency known as the CBDC. And these are the ways that the Democrats and big government want to track every single one of the purchases that you're going to make in the future. 
It's a problem. If you want to go buy a gun, if you want to buy junk food, if you want to go buy, name it, right? This is how they're going to control it. You're going to show up and you're going to go to use a CBDC and they're going to say, nope, you can't buy that. So I strongly oppose it and I do support digital assets, especially Bitcoin. All right, Mr. Clay. Strongly oppose. Thank you. Let's say more. I strongly oppose central digital banking currency. I strongly favor private digital currency. And what we need to do make, make sure is that the government does not have the two bills that are pending now, the two regulations at SEC and at the Department of Treasury that would institute this and would make it illegal to have private digital currency. So this would put you in the position where every transaction you engage in is instantaneously viewed by the federal government. And that, together with the SEG agenda, will cause the federal government to be able to deny you credit, deny you access through banks, for if you're uh, a conservative. Thank you. This is, this is what they're looking for. Thank you very much. When I say our candidates are distinguished, I really mean it. They were able to predict my next question, too. All right, Mr. Parkinson, you partially answered that. Do you support cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin? The question is they support, uh, they support cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. Do you support? Yes. <laughs> but privately. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mr. Rebor. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Garcia. Uh, I do. And I own some in full disclosure. Um, I absolutely support Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. All right, next question, Mr. Smith, why don't you hold on to the mic? If you could eliminate one federal department, which would that be? If you could eliminate one federal department, which one would it be, Mr. Smith? Department of Education. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Mr. Rebar. Department of Education. They took my answer at the Department of Education. <laughs> Who says that Republicans have different ideas, right? <laughs> Department of Education. All right. Next, I think it is Mr. Ebert Stern. So this question is, do you support President Trump? I don't think I need to repeat that question, but I will. Do you support President Trump, Mr. Ebert? Absolutely. And let me just say this. I, I, I have that for personal reasons, actually. That Access to Medical Treatment Act that ultimately became the Right to Try Act, no president of the United States would sign that except Donald J. Trump. And that allows you, that allows you to have access to an experimental drug when you're terminally ill without having to beg the FDA. And Donald Trump signed that bill, who's the only president of the United States who would fight for it. Yeah. <laughs> I've said from day one, I plan to stand shoulder to shoulder with President Trump as we barnstorm across the, the Commonwealth of Virginia. There's only been one man at the federal government at, at the uh, running for the United States uh, presidency for the last 30 years who has been a voice to working people, to truck drivers, to construction workers, and that's the billionaire from New York. I support him 100%, and we're going to win Virginia uh, standing shoulder to shoulder together. Yes, I support President Trump. I've endorsed his candidacy as President of the United States. And I actually got to meet with him backstage when he came to Virginia and Richmond the Saturday prior to Super Tuesday. He told me that he knows he can also win Virginia. There's polling that came out last week. It's a one-point race. It's within the margin of error. We're going to win, but it's going to take all of us. 100 percent. Why don't you hold on to the line? This is going to be one last question from audience that I've got. Would you invite President Trump to campaign for you in Virginia? The question is, would you invite President Trump to campaign for you in Virginia? I absolutely would invite President Trump to campaign for me. I got to tell you, I got some people in the Southwest that are just itching for that opportunity. They're supporting me down there and they're supporting Donald Trump down there. So when this happens, y'all are all invited. We can get on 81. We can do a caravan all the way down there. I promise you it's going to be a, it's going to be the time of your life. And we're actually going to win an election in Virginia in 2024. Mr. 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 Mr.
Yes, and I have been in touch with the Trump campaign, and I've encouraged them to invest in Virginia. Bring them down here, not just once, not just twice. Bring them down here in the beginning of October, the end of October, and the beginning of November so we can win. Thank you. 100%. <laughs> Standing in invitation that will never be revoked. We are coming close to this session. I hope you all enjoyed it. Each candidate, you will have two minutes for closing remarks. This is the closing remarks time. Each candidate will have two minutes to close their case with you guys and make that individual connection. And uh, so this is your turn, but I'm going to go ahead and get started with Mr. Smith on the other side. Mr. Smith, you have two minutes to do your closing remarks, sir. If you arrest an American president, for reasons outside of the law, you will be held accountable. If you bring home the basketball player and leave behind the Marine to rot in a Russian jail, you will be held accountable. If you destroy 33,000 emails oh. and classified documents yeah. after receiving a subpoena, you will be held accountable. If you bring home the basketball player, leave behind the Marines to rot in a Russian jail, you will be held accountable. If you touch one child for the purpose of sex indoctrination, sex orientation, without the full and complete consent of a responsible parent, you will be held accountable. If you fly one balloon over an American sky for the purpose, if you, one at all, or aircraft or anything, you will be held accountable. If you lie to Congress or lie in Congress about a laptop collusion or hoax, you will be held accountable. We've got to get our country back. We've got to get our values back. We've got to get our integrity back because if we don't, we'll continue to be out of touch, out of reach, lost like some ship floating aimlessly through the night, locking up our values along every single nautical mile. But I'm sorry. Because just like the founder of this party, we cannot set freedom free unless we take a page out of history. Where Americans, women and men, boys and girls, begin to lift their heads up, lift their backs up, lift their vision up, lift their faith up, lift their anchor up, and turn this ship around. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spence. We're going to start making a great moment. So this may well be the most important election of our lifetimes, and indeed it is. This is, the, this is it, ladies and gentlemen. This is it. And so we have to ensure that we have the right instrument to fight for us and to work together to achieve the objective of saving our country. It makes a difference what your history is. My whole career has been one of fighting for your rights, and not just fighting, but winning. And winning is the critical thing. We have to have a clear strategy. We have to know exactly what we're doing, not only to defeat Tim Kaine, stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and defeat him, but we also be, need to be able to implement that agenda in Washington. You know, uh, George Washington uh, left us with a very clear understanding that we would be charged with keeping the sacred fire of liberty rekindled each generation. Ronald Reagan put it this way. He said that, if, if, he said that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We did not inherit it in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and defended, and passed on to each new generation. Or one day in our sunset years, we would have to say what it was like in America to be free. We must never allow this to happen. This is it. We've got to protect our nation. We are the majority. Those of us who believe like we do, we are the majority. This country is being held by the throat by a radical minority. And we can overcome this, but we have to rise together. And we have to do it with one strong voice that says, liberty, triumphant, that is America. We will not allow you to enslave us or enslave our children. We will ensure the survival and success of liberty. Why? Because this is the last best hope for liberty on earth, as Abraham Lincoln said. Once it's gone here, it exists nowhere. And we must never allow that sacred fire of liberty to be extinguished. Let us fulfill our destiny. This is our opportunity. The enemy used to be overseas. It's now among us. Let's prevail over that enemy and ensure that our children and our children's children will always be free. Thank you. Thank you.
Friends, you, you, you've you heard everybody here, and you have a decision to make. Who can win in 2024? We know the consequences. We know what's at stake. You've heard a lot of anger. You've heard a lot of people talking about firing people and throwing people in jail. Think to yourself, can that win in 2024 against Tim Kaine? Can that win with this media, with the Democrat money? Can that message win? Or are we, are we going to win with positivity? We're going to win with ideas. Are we going to win by growing the, the coalition that we need to? I believe in evangelizing in order to win, because what Tri Scripture tells me is that the first evangelists, what they do is they take their message to places that are ignorant of their message, that are even hostile to their message, and they stand on the truth. They give witness, they give testimony on what they know to be true and how to live. And what Scripture says is that when they said these things, many were added to their numbers. Friends, I'm telling you here politically, if we want many to be added to our numbers, we got to have somebody that can represent us correctly in 2024. Not somebody who's riddled with scandals, not somebody who's fire and brimstone, somebody who can build the coalition of young people, of veterans, of minorities, of people in your community that have been forgotten, that have been left behind. You, you need a candidate who comes from you. Because if we don't, we're going to have one that comes at us. And so this election, this primary nomination is super important. Year after year, I've seen people look up and, and wonder, how did we get this guy as our nominee? Because you weren't involved in the primary. It's the primary season. The polls are open. I ask you to go to the registrar's office tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock and cast your vote. Uh, I'm the second one from the top. If you slide it in the machine, I tell you, if you slide it in the machine, the light's going to go from red to green. And you're going to be proud of yourselves because you're going to have somebody that you can be proud of. Someone, even in Northern Virginia, where you can put a Garcia sign in your yard, you can put a Garcia bumper sticker on your car, you can wear a Garcia t-shirt or hat that I got in the back, and you can be proud of yourselves. And I promise you, no, none, of the, none of these progressives are, are going to attack you or talk bad about you. Uh, trust me, because they're going to be on our side too. We're going to win in 2024. I got the message for it. I need you standing by my side. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Mr. You know, I want to start out by thanking everybody for coming out tonight. It's Tuesday evening. I, when I walked in, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful out. And you guys chose to spend all this time with four candidates that are fighting to save America. As I've traveled all across our great commonwealth, I've met with thousands and thousands of patriots that are ready to fight back and save our country. And I was in Southwest about a month ago and after the event, there's a little old lady, she comes up to me and she's probably about four foot 10, maybe a hundred pounds. And I'd say she was about 85 years old. And I, I, you know, I'm talking to somebody else and all of a sudden she's like pulling on my, on my elbow, my jacket. And I look at her and she's just like, I'm praying for you. And, you know, we've had a lot of people that have been praying with us. And it means so much to me and my wife, Cortland and our family and we ask for those prayers to continue. I ask you to pray for all of us because, you know, we put a lot of miles on those cars. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a couple of close calls here and there. But I really do have the faith that we can win this race. I think that uh, I'm often reminded of my favorite Bible verse. It's Matthew 17, 20. And it says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell a mountain to move from here to there. I've been planting mustard seeds all over Virginia, and I'm trying to plant some tonight, even though we're on wood. <laughs> but really, I hope you've got the faith that we can win, that we can defeat Tim Kaine, win a Republican Senate majority, and make sure that we save our country. I think that there's an echo happening all across Virginia, from Southwest in the Valley to Hampton Roads and Nova. And if you listen closely, you can hear it too. It says, look out, Timmy. Scott's coming to win. Thank you guys so much. Thank ScottParkinson.com. Last week, I'm going to end your item in session. We still have 15 more minutes. I'm telling you, all the 15 minutes is going to be wonderful. So just hang in there. As we bring this enlightening evening to a close, first let me extend my deepest gratitude. I think Mr. Parkinson took a little bit of my speech. I'm still going to repeat because a lot of people have a uh, difficulty understanding my accent, which is totally okay <laughs> to say that. But I do want to extend the deepest gratitude for all of you being here, Mr. Imor, Mr. Garcia, Mr. Parkinson, and Mr. Smith. I can't tell you how much this means to us and this means to our audience. 
Uh, but on that being said, I also want to thank each of you in the audience. Again, as Mr. Parkinson said, you could be anywhere, but you chose to be here because you care for Commonwealth of Virginia, you care for Governor Youngkin's policy, and you care for this beautiful, a beautiful country. As an immigrant, I can tell you every day I can touch the land and say I'm so blessed to be in this country of the United States. I would dream not be anywhere else but here. I go to my native place, I love it. I stay for three, three weeks at the most, and then I want to get back to my adapted land. I'm telling you, this is a beautiful country. We need these candidates. Go out there, fight for us, and cherish this country. Well, give me just a minute. We do have our Fairfax GOP chairman, newly elected chairman, that is going to speak. And after that, I'm sure, about human I'm sure the candidates will be around here to answer any of your questions. We're all against it. I am. <laughs> I am going to introduce our newly elected chair of Ra Fairfax Republican, Terry Grosser. Um, first of all, can we give it up for Sri Lanka? You did a great job. Thank you. That was great. I love the questions. Um, I just want to really express my gratitude on behalf of all of us that you all have taken this on. What a tremendous job, and we are so grateful to you. So thank you. <laughs> So I want you all to know how hard your GOP in Fairfax is working for you and with you for our candidates. I hope after tonight you are inspired to engage with us. Many of you are, but some of you aren't. And so please support us, join with us. There are a couple different ways you can do that. Go to our beautiful new website. Yes, yes. Make sure that you are signed up to receive the dispatch. This is the main way that we communicate with people. I have had people say to me tonight that they only knew about this through the SUB GOP. We have our own uh, publication that we send out. And FYI, we're changing from Monday to Thursday, so that'll happen next week. Please make sure you're signed up for it. And can I please ask you to support us? We need your financial support. This costs money. Everything we do takes money. Um, please consider donating to the Fairfax GOP. And work with us this year. Let's get one of these men elected. Make sure you vote early for the primary. And let's fight hard for our Virginia and our candidates. Thank you all so much. Good night. No questions. I just want to really thank Val one of those the hero that kind of stays in the background she's kind of helped in doing these questions taking the questions and writing up and stuff so special kudos to valerie and also we have rosie oakley who is also new thank you all so very much i'm sure candidates will be gracious enough to hang around for some time so if you have additional questions feel free to do that and thank you once again candidates we appreciate you god bless you all your families and god bless you